Hey gang, we are in Cherry, Illinois, which is about a hundred miles west southwest of Chicago. And today we're here to investigate this hill here, which was the site of what was called the Cherry Mine Disaster. This was a coal mine, and what you don't see here is underground, more over there are all kinds of passages and tunnels, which was back in 1909, a thriving, huge coal mine. But it was going to be a day of disaster, and it was on a Saturday, Saturday, just before Thanksgiving of November 13th of 1909, and this place was humming. There were no weekends off for the coal miners. This was a bustling business, high profit, and there were 481 men down below working this mine on that Saturday, and boys. There were boys as young as 10 years old, and this mine was not following even the regulations that they had in those days. Very few safety precautions, and to add on top of that, they were running the mine without electricity because the week before the lights went out, the electricity went out, and they decided to go ahead and keep operating with kerosene torches. That's right. Not the torches you see in the caveman or Johnny Quest. This is more advanced torches and they had kerosene supplies. But yes, boy, you talk about a powder keg. And sure enough, on that Saturday, there was a place down below where there were six bales of damp hay that were in a cart. Why did they have hay down there? because mules were pulling these carts around. That's right, hundreds of feet below, down underground, they had these mules. Now let me explain the configuration of what's going on here. Of course, we have in any mine the, the tailings. Now this hill, this mountain you see here, goes up maybe 200, I don't know how many hundred feet, but those are the waste products of the mine, just like a prairie dog digging its hole you're gonna have the, the dirt pile. Any mine, you're gonna see the tailings pile of the waste product. But down below of all this network of horizontal levels like floors of a building, they had, I'm gonna say, three areas, vertical areas. Way down on one end, they had a, what they called the main shaft, and I believe that's where they were bringing the coal out. And there they had a hoist, a, like a platform, a metal cage and they would lower that up and down by cable, hundreds of feet. Can you imagine? And over hundreds of yards away, there were two sister tunnels. One was an air supply tunnel that would, they would use a centrifuge, a centrifugal fan, and they would blow air throughout the, all the, uh, the tunnels that, and would come out presumably the main tunnel and have a circulation. And right nearby that, there was the, escape, the emergency escape tunnel was a way out. 480 men and, and boys down there. And it would turn out that the hay was situated. Six bales were stacked up neatly right under one of those torches. Not a bright idea. And of course, this torch was leaking. Who knows how long, but the hay became saturated with kerosene. And of course, it just took a spark and a spark did come, and that whole hay went up like it went up in a snap. What would it burn on? Well, there's lots to burn on. There were timbers, and you've seen pictures in mines of the ceiling and the walls and all the timbers. Those aren't treated materials. Those are not fire retardant materials. Those go up like matchsticks. So needless to say, that whole thing turned into a, an inferno men were scrambling for the main shaft and the boys. The other two shafts became chimneys that were near the hay. No way to escape out the emergency escape. Now we just had the hoist. What happened next was there were 12 men that volunteered from the town right here. Now when this happened, the bosses the bosses had to make an emergency quick decision, and it may have been a dubious decision, but they decided to reverse the fans, suck the air out, maybe that would dampen or smother the fire, and 
it, it maybe had the reverse effect. And as they did that, they sounded the alarm and it was a whistle. And everybody in town knew what that whistle, that whistle meant, the emergency whistle. And the whole town descended here on this, on this mine to see what was going on. And there were 12 men, as I was saying, who volunteered to go down in that smoke and fire to try to pull men out. There were men conceivably all over the place laying down there with nowhere to go that were injured and dying. These men made six trips down. And one of the men, by the way, his name was Dominic or Dominico Fermento. He's from Italy. And this just shows you fate. He was sitting there in the house that went off. His brother-in-law was on his way out the door. He said, no, 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 you watch the family. I will go. Well, he was one of the 12 men and they weren't all miners that went down. They made six trips down and on the seventh trip, they never came up. And there apparently was some confusion with the hoist operator on the signal to bring them up. They were being burned alive and he wasn't bringing them up. My theory is, and I might be wrong, and, and listen, I'm not the expert on this story, but it could have been that they, had got, they were going all the way down and they were signaling to come back up because the fire had gotten there and he just kept bringing them down, who knows? But the bottom line is, when they came back up, when that thing came back up, they were all horrified to see that each, all these men were burned to a crisp. They were unrecognizable. The only way they could tell who these men were were bringing the widows, the families there, to look at their watches and look at their jewelry and identify them. One of the widows actually died shortly thereafter of heartbreak at the sight of that horror. Well, it took about eight days for things to smother down and finally they started sending men down there to bring up the dead. But there was a miracle. Little did anybody know there were 21 men down there that were still alive. And as they were going down, bringing the bodies up, and by the way, this field here, this is where the bodies were laid out. They didn't know that these men for eight days have barricaded themselves into a trapped chamber. They built an earthen wall out of coal, clay, earth, whatever they could find, they sealed themselves in like they were in a coffin. And basically it was their fate. It was a living tomb. They were going to die there. And on the eighth day in the darkness with no food or water for those eight days, they finally decided to meet their fate and tear the wall down. They couldn't breathe anymore. And they tore the wall down. And as they looked out into the darkness, they saw in the distance lights. You had to wonder, what was that? Was this the end? No, it was the rescuers. They met the rescuers. They lived, all of these men lived. One of those men who was from Italy wrote a very touching note, a farewell note to his wife and son. You can read it, I'll put the link in the description box. There was a video done by one of the granddaughters of one of the other miners and she's got a picture of the note. Well, anyway, these men all went on to leave, lead lives and, and carry on. Uh, but the rest of the men that were laid out here were victims of this horrible disaster. They closed the mine shortly, well, the mine went bankrupt shortly thereafter, as it should have, and the only other, I'll call it rainbow after the thunderstorm, as the, the 21 men was that they changed all the laws and regulations and minimum age for hiring children for labor. It had a huge effect on not only the coal industry, but other industries. No more slave labor of 10 year olds. And uh, it was deplorable yeah, what happened here. So we're going to now go to the cemeteries. Cemeteries, there's one here and there's, a, there's one in Ladd and there's another one I think in Peru. We'll go to at least, I'm gonna to try to go to at least three and let's pay respects to some of these men. I saw it looked like some of the graves had pictures and where there are no pictures, I do have some pictures of 
a couple, I know at least a couple of the heroes. So let's go off, let's look at the graveyard, and let's pay our respects. Hey, the sun came out. What do you know? Well, we are at the Peru City Cemetery now, and I found two graves where I do have pictures. And it happens to be of two of the heroes, two of the 12 men who found themselves, well, they, they found themselves in a dire situation and paid the price. We talked about that. This is Isaac Lewis, 33 years old, and this is his grave. It's a beautiful marker. I don't know what Isaac's position was with the, the mine. I'm not sure if he worked for the mine or if he was just one of the volunteers. But he's a handsome, handsome young man. He gave his life for many others who survived. And his picture, we have his picture. Now we come over here, and this is the grave of Alex Norberg. Alex is buried here with his wife, it looks like. 1975, she was born in, well, 1907. She was born October 1907. No, that might be his, I'm going to guess that's his daughter. Those of you that are good with ancestry maybe can, can take a look. A uh, dashing man with a, a mustache he was. Alex was one of the heroes also who had lost his life rescuing the others. Alex worked as a checkman at the Jonesville mine for six years, 1900 to 1906. And then he entered the employment of the St. Paul mines. And for several months, he was the manager of the third vein at Cherry, at the Cherry mine. He was, uh, as I read, he was survived by his wife and three children. At the time, the oldest was five years of age. So looking at the date, 1909, Dorothy was mm, two years old, around, right? You go October 5th, she was just over two years old when this happened. So there, there you go. Okay, we're going to head next to, I'm going to try and hit Lad Cemetery, but the next one is called Mount, I think it's called Mount Olivet, and there's a few people there we'll take a look at. I'm going to try and hit four today. All right, let's go. We are at the Mount Olivet Cemetery, which is in Spring Valley. It's not more than five minutes away from the Peru City. We're just southwest. We have a couple of men here, the graves of those that lost their lives in the mine. This is John Campasso, and it does say in the inscription, Lost Life in the Cherry Mine, with the date, age 38 years, I believe it says. There is a picture, however it's very clouded very clouded. There's one online on Find a Grave. I may paste in here. We'll see if, actually I'll put it next to it right here, which I believe may have been taken a few years ago, thus a little bit clearer. This is Rodonis Joseph, 
37 years, also lost his life in the Cherry Mine. Rest in peace. Let's take a walk to the north in this direction. We have a couple of more. There's two that I want to see. And one is, as I recall, is of a father and son. There's a lot of old stones here. Very few with pictures. Very few with pictures. Well, the pictures were mostly Italian families and Slavic. Eastern Europeans would, you would see that a lot. Look at this cross. Cast iron. Wonder how old that is. There is a inscription on here. I'll see if I can get, the, let's get the flashlight out and see what, uh, what we come up with here. Um, let's see. Madalena. It looks like Negri. Seatonville, Illinois. 20 years old. She died in 1902. I see another picture over here. On our way, we got this little little tombstone made of rocks. Interesting. Well, we're going to have to use the flashlight again. Looks like a younger, younger woman. CF, can't read that. Sarah? Manny Redini? Well, I was just talking about that. 1887 to 1931. I was just talking about that. Italian. That was the custom. Probably more than more than any other nationality I've seen. Let's head up this way. I see the monument for the father and son. We'll head straight for that in this direction. Yes, this is the this is the plot marker for Ledki or Ladaki. And there is a picture. It looks like someone the picture came down and someone had put it in a protective some type of plastic. But I think this is let's look at the inscriptions here. So we have James, James who lost his life in the Cherry Mine, November 13, 1909, age 42. Oh, terrible, look at this, 14 years old, his son. So James' father, Joseph J. 
Joseph the son, 14 years old. Let's look at the picture. The father. Well, 10 more years, this will be gone too. That's what's sad about all this. Rest in peace. It's a beautiful cemetery. Just quiet. Just the birds. It's a, quite a sanctuary. I'm heading now to, I think, it, last name's Flood. And I think he may have been one of the heroes. Or he was actually, I think, one of the rescued, the last rescued. And it's a very sad story, even though he was rescued. Didn't make it, yeah. John Flood. John Flood, one of the rescuing, no, one of the rescuing, okay. He was one of the heroes. Party of the Cherry Mine. And I'll let you read the dates. He was born in 1860. Underneath that is Charles, who died, it looks like, just a few years later. Is that, say, 1917? And he was 60 years old. Well, John, John wasn't that old, you can see. There was an article that I was able to find. And it said about John, every man was dead except one. He breathed his last five minutes after the cage came to the surface. He was Tom Flood, a mile vein manager. He was a vein manager. It says the elevator, it is believed, reached the second vein when the fire was beginning to take hold in the shaft. And the men were either burned or suffocated. Dr. L.D. Howe, the regular mine physician, attempted to save Flood's life, but he was badly burned and died without regaining consciousness. That's the story. He almost made it, John did. We have some more inscriptions here. I believe this may be his wife. Jane Flood died, well, 1894, 59 years old. I'm not sure who, we can find a, go and find a grave to find out how she's related. We have Alice Flood, wife of John M. Donald, who died in 1903, age 41. And I don't see there are no more inscriptions on this one. So, we're gonna head over to Lad Cemetery right now. And there's one man there, Dominic, or he's Dominico Fermento, one of the heroes, the brother-in-law. You know, he took his brother-in-law's place. I don't have, uh, I hope we can find that grave. That's gonna be a tough one. So, we'll see you there. Well, I've been here for over an hour and no luck finding Dominic. But there are others that we can, we can look at. And there's a lot of graves with pictures here. And go figure, Italians. A lot of Italians here for some reason at Lad. I'll reach over here. 
Frank here died in 1909, but it is, well, it is no, <laughs> November 13th, so here's one of the victims. I had some others I had just finally located and stumbled across Frank here, so a very good find. It's a very old stone here. I am guessing this could be another another victim. We'll do our trusty light. Yes. So looks like an uh, I can't pronounce that first name, Tonelli. So that gentleman over there is Tassetti. This is Tonelli. And yep, Cherry, Cherry, 13th, 1909. So there are a lot here also. Maybe we'll stumble across Dominic's grave, who knows? Yeah, somebody replaced the tombstone. It's a newer tombstone, very small, but very, would be very easy to spot, I would think. I just want to go up here to the front, and I'm looking for the 1909 date. Here's a gentleman right here, interesting picture, Anton, died in 1925. And I'll step back here. Enrica. Here's someone that died fairly young, Maria. Monterestelli, it looks like. She passed in 1918. Alberto, now we go down the line here, do a couple of these, just very intriguing pictures. Take a quick look. Died in 1935, not terribly old, Car Carmelina. Lived to be a ripe old age, looks like. Died in 1977. That would be 90. Almost 90 years old. Didn't quite make it. Let's see. There are. There's uh, something I want to show you too. This purple glass star. And I know there's a. There's a lot of them here. Well, there's one surviving. Or actually, there are two surviving. Hello, Leone. Hello. I'm not going to try to pronounce and butcher Italian names. Unless I'm, <laughs> unless it's easy. Let's see here. Well, let's move. Let me show you this, what I'm talking about. And it's got a sword stuck into the ground. It's a, it has a knight on it. Now you can see this one here had the star that I'm talking about. That's all in Italian, it looks like. But look at this, uh, look at that knight sword. Isn't that, of course it's not real, I'm just saying it's just a cast iron stake. It's really just a stake. And there looks like there's something inside there, like a flower or something. Does anyone know what this is? I read about it before and I can't, I just can't remember, but I think there's a, there's something in there. I don't know if we can see. Anyway, it's beautiful. It's got a beautiful color. Some very old, old graves here. 
But let's keep moving. There is a spot that I want to show you. Sorry about the wind. Illinois, we have the wind out of the north and there's no protection but these fields. I hope it's not going to be too bad. That's a rose. We died in 18... 27 it looks like Now you can see there were There were many of these stars Let's try and get uh, we have an open area up here, but Where I'm going is if you look all the way in the back there there's a whole row right against the cornfield of some really neat, neat old graves. So we'll, we're heading that way. And maybe we'll stumble across, I'll put a picture here of Dominic's tombstone and somebody spots it. Maybe we'll come back and do a, a 60 second video that we found it, <laughs> I don't know. Oh, look at this. Some children here. Charlie and Armida. 1916 death and 1918 death, respectively. They're, both of their pictures are on here. How sad. Yeah, there's a few graves here of kids. I see. Let's see one more here with a picture. Frank Ricardo. Died in 1918, not terribly old. Did not make it to his birthday by just a few days, it looks like. All right, let's head over this way. Here's another one of these purple crystal stars, I'll call it. Let's see if we can see anything in this one. This one has been damaged by the flying rocks. It doesn't look like there's anything in there, so maybe there's nothing to that. It's just it's just glass. It's beautiful though. Oh wait a minute. There is something in there, I swear. Looks like a face. Like face, I don't know. I see that. If I get down at that level, I see. Well, I don't know, but interesting nonetheless. all covered with moss and I don't want to touch that stuff. This says Disastro di Cherry. So Alberto here is definitely a victim. Definitely. No, I, just coming across them there are so many. Bastai. This is the one that I was that I had seen before that is a victim and I don't really I don't know that we can read hardly any of that but I know I looked up I know he's is that Miguel what does that say guys I guess I could look it up on find a grave they're all on find a grave if you want to look and I'll try I'll try to remember to put the link in they there is a page that, if you just put Cherry Mine Disaster, or Cherry Mine, find a grave, just Google that. 
And the whole list comes up of, I think, all the victims. I don't think it's all of them, but a lot of them. So, All right, we're heading up to Cherry. We came five, five miles up this way from Spring Valley. We're heading up to Cherry. And look at that. You can see the hill. You can see the hill to the north. I'll try and zoom in on that. That's eerie. If you look way out in the distance, you can see it right there. zoom in a little more. Look at that. That is way out there, but you can see it. It's a big hill. All right, let's go. Okay, we are all the way back in Cherry, and we are at the Holy Trinity Cemetery here. We're going to be wrapping things up at the Miner's Memorial. There are two graves here that I'm most interested to look at because we have pictures of these men. And on one of the men, I have some background, a background story about him. Cemetery, there's three areas that have that are concentrated with the graves. In the very center of the cemetery, over here, where that flag is, there's, you can see a number of the distinctive stones. They're very similar. And then this line here, and we're not gonna, the video is gonna be getting kind of long, so we're not going to be able to see all the graves, but if you, Along the road here, on the eastern side, you'll see a row. And then here on the far eastern side against this cornfield is this grouping here. And there's some more, there's a few more sprinkled around. But the person that we want to view, and what's interesting by the way of these six graves is this one and this one only has a, a concrete slab over over where the body is the coffin but this is Anton Vessel I'm gonna have to get thank God I have the, the handy dandy flashlight I'll tell you we wouldn't be able to see anything me or you so let's see what we got to the side here and Anton Vessel, and there's the date, and I think it says 28 years, 25 years maybe, well, let me, let me drop this flashlight here in my pocket, and then I'm going to right now bring up the picture of Anton. It says Anton Vessel was an immigrant who came from Austria and he worked in the cherry mine. He met Francis, Francis Jurkas, while staying at a boarding house her mother ran. They got married in 1905. Francis was only 15 or 16 years old when they were married even though their marriage certificate shows she was 18. This picture that I have here is the only picture of Anton, and it is at their wedding. It's his wedding picture. He left her widowed at 19. She was 19 with two boys, and she was pregnant with the third. She gave birth to the third child on December 6, 1909. Think about that. Three weeks later or so, wow. Anton's body was one of the last ones that was brought up out of the mine in February. And the only way that Francis was able to identify him was by a patch on the bottom of his shoes. Very sad. Anton, rest in peace. There are some beautiful flowers here for Anton and others. 
Let's go this way. We will pass some of the graves on our way to the other man that I wanted to talk about. There's also a boy here when I did the, the the opening scene, I did stop by here before going to the other cemeteries, the circle, as we're back here, and I did find out online that a boy here, Russell Blaine, was with his friend August 27th, 2006, and they were driving at excessive speeds, as boys do at that age. 16 years old, yeah, he just turned 16. He was 16 by about a month, and they wiped out. They wiped out, and they were both killed. You know, I have to say I was doing the same thing when I was 16. I guess I was lucky. It says there's a picture of an ATV, and it says Virginia Beach, Virginia, and... I don't know if that's an island with a lighthouse or, no, I, I think that looks like an aircraft carrier or a battleship, because I see a wake. But whatever it is, it had to have been his passion. And I see a American flag here that's, that's bowed over but properly placed. So a very sad story here. Let's work our way this way. The wind has stopped momentarily for us. We're, we're completely exposed to the north wind here in this giant, endless farm field. So hopefully the luck is with us. around these graves here. So here are some more stones. I guess we have to come on this side. John P.S.A.K. I'm guessing he was Eastern European. Of course, all the same death date. Well, you know what? I can't resist. The video's long, it's long. Skip through it. But I want to pay respects here to these people. Is that Pavlik? It's a husband, George. And he was 25 years old only. 25 years old. Here's a father, Paco, Andrew, Cherry Hill disaster. Uh, he was born in 1870 on June 15th. So, wife died in or. Well, 1874. Oh, born. She was born in 1874. So, you know, I've seen some of these. Here comes the wind. Uh, some of these stones have the husbands. And when if, if they die when they're young, if they die and their wives, you know, they remarry. And it, you see the place, the blank spot for them. It's really sad because they're... The wives move on with their lives. Understandably, they remarry and they go many times somewhere else. All right, we're heading, we're heading this way to that single lone large stone that's right in the center. This is the grave of Edward Mills and his wife, Isabel. Isabel lived to 
looks like 67 years. The last thing we're going to check out here is right up here is the memorial. And as I approach back to the street, this is the the back side of the memorial that the miners here dedicated to these men. It's a beautiful stone. There is an inscription. And it says, to the memory of the miners who lost their lives in the Cherry Mine disaster, November 13, 1909, erected by the UMW of A District Number 12, Illinois, November 13, 1911. And the sorrowful woman. Well, it's a very sad story here. And that's going to wrap it up for today. And we'll see you guys on the next one.